yeah, he certainly was. He was more like a father figure, really, um, or a grandfather, as I used to joke with him <laughs> with his age. But uh, yeah, like, I guess, you know, anyone who's met him would have had the privilege of meeting him and then knowing how amazing he was, such a humble man, a guy who just a great enthusiasm for sport and, and football and, and hurling in particular. Uh, we feel very fortunate that he came on board with us uh, when we had nothing won and he had like amassed a great CV and I think he's a Munster, Munster coach, uh, uh, titled his name and everything, uh, he won that award. But yeah, like a lovely man, very humble, very knowledgeable, great emotional intelligence and IQ about him and, and well able to um, send a message and tell us, you know, what he wanted from us, but in a lovely way, not a kind of a preaching way, but a, in a story kind of telling way. And uh, yeah, just a, a great guy who really had players at the heart of everything and 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 made it enjoyable for us. And, you know, that's why we all stuck at it for so long and had, had such great memories and wanted to be part of that, that tight-knit group that he had formed and ensured was cultivated. Mm. I saw Orla Farmer tweeting earlier that a good coach can change a game, a great coach can change a life, and that seems to be what you're touching on, that he didn't just have that impact on the pitch, that actually when you look at that bond that that group had over a 10, 12-year period, and you still see so often you coming together that he created something there that's going to last long after him. Yeah, certainly. I mean, he he knew, I guess, what it took to be a good team and, and to to be solid and, and you know all striving for the one goal. And he would have always have referred to us as and we as you know the collective, like with the with the management and the squad. So we were all very much as one and like a family. And he certainly helped create and foster that kind of environment and and very much looking out for everyone. And you know, you you knew that he was always had your back and you know, had a great loyalty to players and maybe played us when we weren't playing our best, but knew that, you know, we were loyal to him too. And there was that nice uh, reciprocal kind of relationship. And certainly off the pitch would have helped many people, uh, you know, helped me with some Irish and in preparation for interviews and, you know, with my kicking game and, and going down to Banagheri and doing extra shooting with me, uh, you know, probably uh, discreetly telling me I needed it to practice, but, you know, I had a lovely way about it. And it was lovely spending time with him and, a great guy to tell a story and and um, loved loved the just the simplicity of things and you know this the the things like um, after that whistle when the whistle blows and just having the sing songs and you know the, just the simple pleasures of life and and the, the camaraderie and the sing song like we used to always gather together after in, in Co Park in that uh, warm up area and have our sing songs and our photos and our bit of crack before we went into the family um, reception and up to Quinn's. So, yeah, yeah we, we had a great time. And, and even today, I was like looking back on clips of him and also reading some of the book Relentless that Mary White had written. And, and it's lovely that those memories are captured and we can always refer back to them if our, if our own memories tend to go. Was Eamon a man to take part in the sing song? He was, yeah. Um, you know, no more so than when we went up to the president and we got invited and, and uh, you know, you couldn't refuse the president's um, request. <laughs> so there was a few people caught there. Thankfully, I wasn't one because they knew damn well what would happen. But like the likes of Juliet, they yeah, had my name, and I think sang that day. And yeah, he would have sang, but he he would have um, he loved us singing simply the best. Actually, it was a lovely one. And you know, for such a humble guy, he, he had us shouting out, singing the best uh, when the victories came and all around point of the day. But uh, yeah, I mean, great memories and just very grateful. I think a lot of us. Uh, definitely were shaped by him and, you know, became better people more so than athletes. Um, and he, he just always ensured that we loved going to training and it was always a pleasure and there was always some crack or wit about him. And, uh, you know, a man who, who just loved the simple things and, and really devoted a lot of time and attention to us. And what I loved about him is he, he treated us as, as athletes and players and not as female athletes. Like he didn't make that distinction because he felt that it was actually would have reduced our our value a bit. Yeah, you, you mentioned uh, the emotional intelligence there. I want to play a clip actually because uh, just after, yeah. I think it might have been the week after actually, uh, that you won the 10th All-Ireland back in 2015. He was in the studio with us, he was talking to Jer and I just want to play the clip of what he had to say. you got to know the game. You don't have to be able to play it well, but you've got to know it well so that you can teach it, explain it. And if a player is doing something, I don't know what my language is, it's not not the right way. 
that you're able to give him feedback that's that, that, that that's positive and that it's relevant and that it's not bull like you know yeah and uh, I think you also need to have and I wouldn't have got this for a long time in my life I only developed it in the last maybe 24 you've got to have an empathy and a sympathy with the player you've got to be able to understand what the player is trying to do and to actually realise that this is a difficult skill to perform particularly in the modern game which is played three times faster than the game I played but crucially as well the sympathy to realise that when the player makes a bags of it that she's the last person that wanted to make a bags of it was that actual player. He didn't make a bags of it for the for the sake of it. Yeah. And if you haven't this, I think you're in serious trouble because what you're trying to create ultimately is an environment where the player will flourish. Now, if you haven't the empathy and the sympathy, you won't facilitate the, the flourishing of the player's skill and like the skill a tangent to that is, is really the player's personality and the player's mm. emotional stability and the player's outlook on the whole thing. Sorry, you know, I'm done a bit there. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, great stuff from Eamon Ryan. Describing his coaching and managerial technique, Valerie Mulcahy is with us paying tribute. And I guess you, you need to remind yourself sometimes, Valerie, that Cork hadn't won a ladies' senior All-Ireland before Eamon Ryan came in and took over. And to go and do two five-in-a-rows is unprecedented and may never be done again. And I guess we got a good glimpse there of actually what he was all about, of what made him so great. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, we were very, very fortunate to have him come on board when we really had nothing to our name and, and no titles. And, you know, we could hardly get out of Munster. We actually probably didn't. So, um, you know, to take that chance on us was, was amazing. And, um, yeah, he was very much an empathetic person. I remember after one, one match down in Kerry and I felt like I had a chance that, that could have won the match and I didn't uh, score it. I think it went short or wide and, you know, he was immediately empathetic and put his hand around me and, and said, it's okay, Valerie, I think you've won us enough matches. You know, something like that that really kind of made you feel okay about things and, and little things, lovely with praise when it was due and, but like uh, equally tough and, and, you know, wouldn't say anything for the sake of it. it was very, was very measured in what he was saying and, um, just we had great days out in the farm and used to see grounds, you know, like it was our home is very simple, very basic, but we loved it and, and all we needed was some footballs and some bibs and, and away we went and you know, he, he definitely created that environment and ensured that we, we flourished in it and, and was very much player led, always looking at the player and, you know, he actually rarely even mentioned the opposition. It was all about us and what we could do and and ensuring we got the best of ourselves. And I think we felt that going out in matches that we were we had that freedom to play, you know, what we saw in front of us and, and there was no real tactics. It was, you know, he had trusted in us, you know, entrusted in us um, just go and play and, and mm. do our best and, and you know, very much never gave out to us if we did make mistakes because he knew that if we fecked up, it wasn't yeah, intentional he, really. He spoke about his latter career there where he had such enormous success, but actually he was steeped in the GEA and had played senior county with Cork, had managed the men's Cork team during the 80s and they had this famous victory over Kerry in the Munster final in 83 and had huge success at club level as well. So one of those people who just dedicated his life to the cause. And I was surprised when I saw he was 79 because in the few occasions I met him, he came across as such a young man. He never lost that enthusiasm. Yeah, no, I think he was young at heart and he, he surrounded himself with, with younger people and, and teams and that's where he always wanted to be and that's where he was at his happiest and with a smile on his face and um you know very very much cherished it and, and i was listening to a little clip he was in, being interviewed and i was watching it today and he was just saying like this is one of my hobbies i love it i love the winning and and um well it's not really all about the winning and losing like yeah i'd be lying if i said i didn't enjoy the winning but it's really about being part of it and and it was just one of his main hobbies and interests and you know, even in the winters, he like he he once tried. He was involved with Ballingeri and his home place, and uh, with the lads there. And he was also involved in the Pierishig. And you know, he was very sought much sought after. So I think we were very fortunate. Obviously, we had we had a good impact on him also to to manage to ensure that he stayed with us for the twelve years. And um, as I said, we're I'm very honoured that that he was you know led the way and that uh, we had that opportunity and. And managed to create something special and i think you know he he said he was involved with 60 years and different teams and that and 
you know, he even managed to play dual. He was player and manager at one stage. And when I was taking on Bally Bowden, I was asking him about that. And he was like, play as long as you can, play as long as you can. <laughs> you know, so very good for the for the advice. And, um, you know, he'd be sorely missed. And, and we're all very sad, but uh, very grateful that, that we have these memories that we can cherish forever. Yeah, he has certainly left you with some great memories. Valerie, thanks a lot for coming on. Our sympathies again. Thanks for paying tribute, Damon Ryan. Thank you. That is Valerie Mulcahy, who played in all 10 of those All-Ireland final victories with Cork. Uh, we've been paying tribute to the late Eamon Ryan, who passed away at the age of 79. You are listening and watching the news round here on Off the Ball and News Talks. But thanks to Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette made of what matters. Richie McCormick is with us as well. Good evening, Richie. Good evening, Nathan. How are you? Uh, I'm very well. Um, Father Mulcahy paying fitting tribute there, I think, to Eamon Ryan. And as I say, you do need to remind yourself the Cork... <laughs> Now we look at them as having been such a dominant force and one of, if not the greatest team Gaelic Games has ever seen, that they hadn't actually ever won it before he arrived on the scene. I remember being um, in the office the day of that panel, actually in the week um, leading up to that panel that, that Eamon appeared on. Um, Derek McGrath was there, Anthony Moyles was there. I think Breach Stack was in the studio as well, if memory serves, I could be wrong. Um, or it might have well even been, been Valerie there. But either way, it took a lot of coaxing for him to actually come in and do the panel. I think we'd wanted to get a hold of him for a while, but such was his nature that I think, and this is coming from the players, that he never wanted the focus, he never wanted the attention to be on himself. It was always going to be on the players and of their achievements. And he, as you heard in that clip uh, that we pulled from that panel, he wanted to channel everything he knew into the players and he wanted them to go on and take the next steps because of stuff that he taught them and it would be their achievement from there on it wouldn't be his and that's very much how he saw things an exceptionally humble exceptionally graceful man uh, never ever kind of saw to be um seeking publicity courting publicity courting praise uh, for the achievements of cork during the decade plus that he was in charge of them it's just one of these remarkable figures you know you, you know you've done okay when heads of state are paying tribute to you when you, when you passed michael martin uh, tweet past errors say very sad to hear the passing of Cork Gaelic football legend Damon Ryan uh, among his many achievements was incredible success managing the Cork team to tell our own titles a complete gentleman uh, rest in peace Cork it seems uh, morning uh, at Damon Ryan's passing this evening and, and rightly so he did an incredible service to his county down through what 60 plus years with him yeah and should mention, as I said, he played for Cork, he managed the Cork men's side, and he was the man who was in charge. He came up quite a lot recently when Mark Keane scored the late goal yeah. for Cork to beat Kerry this time, when the same thing happened in 83, when Ty Murphy scored with pretty much the last kick of the game to beat Kerry by a point. So, again, 60 years dedicated to the cause, and I'm sure there's going to be many, many more tributes uh, to Eamon Ryan over the coming days and weeks. Uh, what else is going on today, Richie? Yeah, Paddy Andrews today confirmed his inter-county retirement. The St. Bridges Ford won seven all Ireland titles during his time on the Dublin panel. Andrews also collected just the 11 Leinster senior medals and five national leagues along the way. He said it was a privilege to play for the Dublin footballers. Arsenal, they have the chance to climb inside the Premier League's top 10 tonight. They've won each of their last three top fly matches and indeed in the cup as well ahead of Crystal Palace's visit to the Emirates. The teams are in for this one. Bernd Leno starting goal. Hector Bayron, David Luiz, Rob Holding and Ainsley Maitland-Niles are Arsenal's back four. In midfield, then you've got Grana Xhaka and Teresa Bios with Bakayo Sacco and Emile Smith-Rowe and indeed Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang in support of Alexandre Lacazette. For Palace, Vincent Guita starts in goal. Back four, then of Joel Ward, James Tompkins, Cheku Kiate and Tyreek Mitchell. In midfield, then Andros Townsend, Captain Luka Milivojevic and James MacArthur with Eberet Ezzi alongside Christian Benteke and Wilfred Zaha in a front three and kickoff is at 8 o'clock. Yeah, and we'll keep you up to date throughout the evening on the football show as well. Uh, some more developments around the Champions Cup and what is going to become of the Champions Cup? Yeah, it seems not a surprise, but um, one of the stakeholders, let's say, have broken ranks and blabbed about what's going to happen with the Champions Cup. The English Premiership's chief executive claims the remaining rounds of Champions Cup pool games have been abandoned. Earlier this week, of course, pressure from the French government saw the European rugby competitions suspended, but Darren Childs says the outstanding pool matches won't be rearranged. Instead, it seems the Champions and Challenge Cups will revert to a knockout competition. It's something EPCR chief exec uh, Vincent Gaillard earlier on in the week as well. Uh, nobody seems to be going along with my great idea of running it off country by country and giving us what we want, which is 
four Irish provinces in together. Either one of them qualifies yeah. for a semi-final or two of them qualify for a quarter-final. I don't, I don't think we're going to have crowds in before the end of the Champions Cup. But either way, you do the same in France, you do the same in England, and maybe the Scottish and the Welsh just get together. And there's no travelling yeah. involved. You can sort of play it when you want, but it gives these old rivalries something really at stake. Uh, yeah, and I think that's something that could be explored because they haven't just said, listen, we're going to just do a knockout format and this is the way it's going to be from here on in. They say they're going to take some time and think about how it's going to be done and I think it'll be next week by the time we actually know uh, what format or possibly beyond uh, what format the the knockout phase, um, if it's going to be such, is going to take. But that would make absolute sense for any number of reasons. It would completely assuage any French worries about travel and um, down to until what the semi-finals or the final uh, so yeah it would make absolute sense to, to run it off on a country by country basis and, and whittle it down that way because at the moment it just doesn't seem with the calendar the way it is with travel the way it is or not uh, at the moment that there's any way to play it off in a kind of cross country way Brian O'Driscoll is going to be picking what would be his Ireland starting 15 for the Six Nations opener against Wales that's coming up just after 8 but Wales going to be without one of their main men yeah, Liam Williams is going to miss Wales opening Six Nations game. It's with Ireland, funnily enough. The Scarlet's wing has been banned for three matches after being sent off in a recent Pro 14 game with Cardiff. Ireland, of course, visit the Principality Stadium on February 7th, the opening weekend of the Six Nations. Uh, plenty of GA coaching news around today as well. Stephen Poacher has joined Anthony Cunningham's backroom team with the Roscommon footballers. The down native worked successfully alongside Turlough O'Brien with the Carlo footballers in recent years. Meanwhile, All-Ireland winning coach Donal O'Grady has returned to the Cork curling ticket he's going to work alongside current manager Kieran Kingston on coaching and analysis sport and performance psychologist Cahill Sheridan has also joined Kingston's backroom team today we could do a little sting for this Richie Richie McCormack's COVID update what is the issue today plenty of them uh, and crossing different sports as well we already knew of course that Ireland's uh, one day series with the UAE in Abu Dhabi is pretty much uh, teetering on a precipice because of COVID cases over there. So no matches today. And Andy Murray is a major doubt for the Australian Open tennis. The former world number one has tested positive for COVID-19. He was due to travel to Melbourne on a charter flight, but is now isolating at home in the UK. The first Grand Slam of the year begins on the later date of the 8th of February. The uh, COVID crisis, of course, still hitting the Premier League and Aston Villa in particular. Sunday's meeting of Villa and Everton postponed today. Villa still have a number of players self-isolating following a COVID outbreak at the club. Meanwhile, their game against Newcastle that was called off in December has been rearranged for Saturday, January 23rd, FA Cup weekend. Both sides out, of course. I'll tell you, Richie, this is a bleeding nightmare if you've got children obsessed with fantasy football and who are <laughs> planning and plotting in advance. It's twice now yeah. I brought my kids up. I brought them up around Driscoll earlier. I think this is the problem with homeschooling. I have nothing else to talk about now. Nothing yeah. going on in my life but my children. But I got up a couple of weeks ago and anyone who's still playing fantasy football and still involved at this stage will know there's sort of a half game week this week and a double game week for a lot of teams next week. But then some of those teams aren't now playing because games have been postponed and people have been planning for this. I woke up uh, and I got up one Saturday morning and my seven-year-old was sitting there watching the TV, watching YouTube with some lad explaining how to take advantage of this double game week. And he had about a million (laughs) views on it. Yeah, I'm not surprised. It's like it's a massive thing. It's come a long way. I don't know if you were of the generation as well that were kind of um, first responders to, to fantasy football oh. whereby you had to ring a phone number. In the Star newspaper. Out of the paper. Yeah, I used to pick mine out of the Indo. Dad had the Indo home every day and used to pick my team uh, out of that. Uh, quickly uh, let the team go to pot once uh, the first phone bill came back as regards what the... Uh, the, the first call it cost but yeah it was like to, to think how easily it's done and I get WhatsApp messages as a group of us in, in one WhatsApp group where they're involved in some fantasy game and they have to constantly remind one of the lads to change their team mm. on the morning of a game and that has been pinging almost incessantly because of all these rearrangements. So my sympathies uh, go to your young fella and to any YouTubers trying to keep up with this as well. Well, I was so obsessed when I was in school in uh, LCVP, as it was, which was sort of a half transition year type, dossy type thing. Oh, we had to, do, yeah, yeah. to do one of these mini companies. And my one was built around a fantasy football game for the school. And it was the most time consuming thing. So I did it from the star fantasy football. So you could enter your team and then I would collate your scores from and I must have had like 200 entries. I had to do this every Tuesday, go through every single team. I think we made a lot of money, but I think on a per hour basis, it really wasn't worth it. There was a family in Ackle who's winning every year. We've got computers for that kind of thing now, Nathan. Hmm? We've got computers for that kind of thing. I know, I know, I know. This is how old I am. But I'm sure someone knows, because 
There's a Gaelic football, fantasy football, that I saw people were taking part, and there was a family from Ackle who had quite a few of the leading teams in the Gaelic football one a couple of weeks ago, or just before Christmas. And I'm fairly sure the mm. exact same family used to win the one in the star every single year. So how did they do it? What did they know that the rest of us didn't know? Did they were they, they're, some sort of formula? They're in Ackle, Nathan. Because we've they're seen living, this. They've got nothing to do. Well, like, I, I, I get that, but like we've seen this where... The, so last year there was controversy with the Premier League fantasy football because the yeah. guy who won it had made some um, remarks online that got him thrown out and somebody else won it. But there was a chess grandmaster who was leading pretty much yeah. the entire way through and was right in contention. So clearly there's some degree of being smart or being your brain being wired in some way gives you an advantage that clearly I don't have, unfortunately. Yeah, they, that's good what the uh, second series of the Queen's Gambit apparently is going to be about. It's going to be about some lad in Malaysia <laughs> who's, you know, proficient at picking fantasy, fantasy football, football teams. Yeah, Richie, right now I would watch a six-part series on that. <laughs> Listen, I'm going to make the pitch to Netflix tonight. Uh, that thing is going to be made. Uh, all right, we're pretty much done for the news round. Just to let you know, Richie, because uh, just in case you're bored this evening, Golf Weekly is up. Uh, oh it is on uh, all our social channels right now, and you can subscribe, Ooh. and you will get that. And also, bonus, yeah. OTBAM are moving into the golf sphere, and they had Steve Scott, Ventures. who was beaten by Tiger Woods in the US Amateur in the mid-90s. He was on talking to Owen Sheehan about that experience and being around Tiger as the mayhem all started. So that is well worth checking hey, out as well. Do you know what I saw this week speaking of golf? Um, this is going to be good. I, lo I love a good muckraking biography or autobiography. Apparently, uh, Tiger's autobiography is going to be coming out. It's due for release by, I think, Simon & Schuster are putting it out. Uh, Master's Week. Right. Yeah. How, would, how good would that be? Thumbing through Tiger's, you know, meaty, let's say, autobiography, going through the good parts while he's possibly in contention. Is it, it going to be meaty? Is it going to be ah, meaty? Yeah. It has to be. There's going to be a lot it of pictures in that, Richie. A lot of pictures of him celebrating and not too much mention of a certain maybe two-year spell where things went a little bit crap. I know. There had, like, there absolutely has to be. Like, it'll be such a letdown if he goes through a uh, <clears throat> an autobiography and he's like, well, and then between the years 2011 and 2015, nothing, nothing much happened. Um, but, you know, it's fine. We'll move on to my master's success later in my career. No, it's like, this has to have all of the good dirt in it. It's going to be like, the, the equivalent is going to be Evan Dando of the Lemonheads is releasing his, uh, his memoirs in 2022. So I think Tigers is going to be the equivalent for Tales of Debauchery. Is it the first time that Evan Dando and Tiger Woods have been compared? I'd like to think so. I would imagine so. That is what Richie McCormick brings us on the news round. Richie, great stuff as always. Nice and Aiden. All right, so Brian O'Driscoll coming after 8 o'clock. Sunita Pishpure as well on the football show. We'll talk to the former Manchester United player Ben Thornley ahead of their game against Liverpool. Tim Vickery. And up next, it is John Giles. The News Round on Off The Ball. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette.